God. Glory to God. We'll remain standing. Grab the hand of the person next to you. Glory to God forever. Aren't you glad we have unspeakable joy? Praise God. Let's pray for each other this morning. Pray for that person on your left and on your right. Hallelujah. If you can, let them hear you praying for them. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Father, your word says that we should pray one for another. And so we take you at your word. We honor your word. We're obedient to your word. And so we pray right now for our brothers and sisters. We pray one for another. We thank you, God, for your miracle working power. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We pray for Levon that couldn't make it this morning. We pray for others that couldn't make it this morning. In Jesus' name, we speak to you and say, be healed right now. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your grace is sufficient. We thank you, Father, that we've attained mercy through the blood. We thank you, Lord, that we're saved, we're healed, blood-bought, sanctified, made free, set alive. Glory to you. Thank you for sonship in the body. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. We give you praise for your word. Your word has been elevated. Your word is all powerful. Your word speaks and it happens. Your word has the same power out of our mouths that it has out of yours because it's your word. It's your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you. It's health to our flesh. We thank you. It sets things into motion. We thank you. It calls things that be not as though they are. Thank you, Father, for your word. We set our attention to it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want you to turn this morning to Mark chapter 9 and Matthew 19. I want to look at both those texts. Mark 9 and Matthew 19. This morning... We're going to talk about a miracle working God. A miracle is a supernatural intervention in the ordinary course of nature. A temporary suspension of the accustomed order through the Spirit of God. We have a miracle working God. Sometimes we forget that there is hope in hopeless situations. Sometimes we forget that the creator of every organ in your body can recreate that organ if necessary. Or if that's what's needed. We, we, can, we forget sometimes that we can have a miracle in the mind. You know, sometimes people can believe a miracle for everything except the mind. They think, well, I have a, 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 a senility. I have to be senile. Or there has to be Alzheimer's. No, God can remake that organ too. The mind is nothing but an organ. You don't have to have a senior moment. Come on now. You have to have a God moment. He's a God of miracles. I don't imagine you may know who this is, but a lady by the name of Daisy Gillock and her husband Cecil, they pastored a church in Odessa called the Odessa Tabernacle Assembly of God Church, and they pastored it for years. They were friends with my grandparents, and they would come to Del Rio uh, and, and preach. And I tell you, Daisy, Daisy was just as good a preacher, if not better, than uh, her husband Cecil. I, I think maybe Daisy got asked to preach more than even Cecil did. But uh, uh, you might know Daisy's brother. Uh, Daisy Gillock, her brother was T.L. Osborne. And so she had been in many crusades all over the world with her brother, and uh, not to be confused with T.L.'s wife. T.L.'s wife was also named Daisy, and so sometimes people will confuse those names. But she talked about a miracle when she and her brother were somewhere in South, Af South America, I believe, and they were praying for a man, and, and uh, actually uh, a, a young man, maybe a teenager at the time, and did not know that he had two glass eyes, and did not know that this blind individual uh, did not even have eyeballs. Eyeballs had been completely removed because of a freak accident that happened when he was a kid a and had no optic nerve, no eyeball, nothing to reflect image. And all of a sudden, this boy started seeing. 
Well, she had told of this testimony several, several times. And I remember my grandfather uh, one day asked, well, we would, does this guy go around and, and speak? We'd like to have him in the church. And so one day this man, grown man by this time, middle-aged, came to our church there in Del Rio, Texas. And he uh, took out his glass eyes, you know, after he told the testimony of what God had done. And, you know, you could hold anything, and there's nothing but holes there. And you could hold anything in front of him, and he would read it for you. And see, that was, that's a miracle, isn't it? That's not a healing. He's seeing without eyes. <laughs> He's seeing without optic nerves. That's, that's a miracle, okay? That's a miracle. Miracle still happens today. Still happened today. Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. You know, it's not a matter of, are there uh, any miracles happening in the world today? It's a matter of, is there anybody who believes today? Because all things are possible to him who believes. And then if you look over at Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. There are things that are impossible with man. There are things that are against nature. There are things that are against the laws that God's already put into place, and they're called miracles. Parting of the Red Sea, that was a miracle. Right? That's not supposed to happen. You know, that's not an isolated event. You know, it also happened when they, went to, to, uh, uh, when they went across into the promised land that the Jordan receded. Do you know that wasn't an isolated event? Do you know that Elijah struck it with his mantle and it parted? Do you know that Elisha took that same mantle that was Elijah's and struck it again and it parted again? We serve a miracle working God. He's a God of miracles. All things are possible. This is the attitude for a miracle. An attitude for a miracle is not it's impossible. An attitude for a miracle is all things are possible. It might not be possible in the natural, but with God, it's possible. When I was a teenager, I had to have a tooth filled. And I had, you know, uh, I, I had been already delivered of so many fears. But one I still had is I had a fear of shots. And I didn't want the Novocaine. And so I told the dentist, no shot. He said, son, we're going to have to drill this down and put the filling in. I said, no shot. Don't put a shot in. And so I think he figured he'd start, and then I'd be, okay, put a shot, put a shot. But, but I didn't. He started drilling, and I prayed. See, I, I, I didn't have the faith not to have the fear, but I had the faith that with God all things are possible. I said, God, I need you to, I need you to numb my mouth right now. I need you to numb it just like a shot would. And I mean, I prayed that, and my gums started getting numb. I had no more feeling in them. And then my, my, my jaw started getting numb. I had no more feeling in that. And, and he continued drilling, and I had no discomfort. And there was nothing to wear off because of the mighty power of God. And I had no soreness later. Now, all things are possible. You, you know, you, you, when you have that childlike faith that says, Hey, you know, grown-ups say this is impossible, but I believe God. You have to have that childlike faith even now. You know, granny may say it's impossible. Husband may say it's impossible. Aunt may say it's impossible. But you believe God. For with God, all things are possible. Man says it's too late. But God says all things are possible. Man says give up. God says all things are possible. Man says it can't be done. But God says all things are possible. Have you ever noticed that the, that the minute somebody says something can't be done, there's somebody doing it? <laughs> and they might not even know God. They just have a determination, don't they? In the, look at 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings 17. Let's read about Elijah here. Because God is a miracle worker, and you might need a miracle of provision. He's a miracle worker. Even in provision. You might need a financial miracle. I've, I've needed a financial miracle before. You know, when you need a financial miracle, it, it really doesn't matter if it's $100 or a million dollars. It's all the same. Right? It, it, it really doesn't matter how many zeros are on the other end of it. You need a miracle. You know what I mean? 
If you don't have a hundred dollars, you might as well owe a million. Come on now. You need a miracle. First Kings 17, verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he rose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. Now remember God said, I told her, I told her, I already told her. And he called to her and said, Please, bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks, that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Well, that's not a very good outlook. I'd say she needs a financial miracle. Um, she's about to eat. This is the last meal, and this... You know, people on death row get a better last meal than this. This wasn't a requested last meal. This wasn't, I believe I'll have T-bone and then I'm going to die. No, this is a handful of flour. Not how much bread you think, you, and, and, you know, my hand's probably big, you know, compared to this little Middle Eastern woman, right? As she said, all I have is a handful of flour. That ain't a lot of bread, folks. That, that's not a lot of bread for two people to share. You know, I've been hungry before. I don't know about you. And you know, if I was on my way out the door and we had some nice, you know, if I had some nice bread, not a loaf of bread, but some nice, uh, you know, not the, not the, not Mrs. Baird's, but Mrs. Somebody Else. Some nice bread, you know, or a roll. Anybody like a roll? Dear God. Sometimes, you know, when Charity makes roast and potatoes and, and carrots and puts it all together, and then there's some hot rolls. Sometimes dipping several rolls and everything is just as good as a meal itself. I Me. Mean. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I'm very familiar with the scripture that man can't live on bread alone. Because when I'm hungry, a piece of bread ain't going to cut it. That's not what he meant, but, uh, but that's the truth, isn't it? You, if you're really hungry, just a slice of bread ain't going to be enough. You're going to need some substance other than that bread. Well, she said, we're going we're gonna to die. We're going to eat it and die. Verse 13, Elijah said to her, do not fear. That's very key. Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But make me a small cake from it first. <laughs> now, you know, some people will be thinking, you didn't hear me right. If I make you a small cake first, then I can't do what I said I was going to do. You see, the prophet's saying, yeah, go ahead and do that. Yeah, go ahead and make yourself something. Make, make something for the boy. But first, but first, make me a little cake. But first, put me a little something. You know, Jesus said you ought to seek first the kingdom. And that other things will be added to you. He said, yeah, yeah, do, make you something. Make you something. There's going to be something there to be made. Make you something. But first, first, first make me a cake. And then he, and then he said this. For thus says the Lord God of Israel. The bin of flour shall not be used, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the earth. This was not a Jewish woman. But the prophet spoke to her and said, Thus says the God of Israel. Hallelujah. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and, she and he, Elijah, and her household ate for many days. Ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. That was a miracle, wasn't it? That's a miracle of provision. I, I, I remember a particular miracle of provision out of stupidity. A miracle of provision out of stupidity, because I had to take a, a, a church van to Grape Creek, and, uh, and then I left Grape Creek, and I was on the lake road, and I saw that, that the needle was below E. And I just happened to remember that before it ever left the church, last time I parked it, it was already on E. And, and so I needed a miracle provision right there. I needed, the, I needed the gas tank to not run dry. Well, you know it didn't. Made it right on into town. Made it to a gas station. You know, I can't, I, I don't want to uh, seem like I'm bragging about this, but I can't tell you how many times that I hadn't noticed that I was on E. 
And I had to get somewhere. And I had to pray, Lord, help me get to this gas station. And then sometimes I wanted to go to the better gas station because, you know, if you can save three cents a gallon, it's worth the five-mile trip. (laughs) So I had to get specific with God. God, I'm not stopping at Stripes. I'm not stopping at All Subs. God, I want to get all the way to H-E-B. And I don't want to get to any H-E-B. God, I want to get to H-E-B over there by Southland. (laughs) Amen. But he's a miracle-working God. This didn't make sense to the widow. Make this prophet a cake? How big a cake do you think a handful of flour makes? It's not going to be a big cake. He said, and he asked her, bring it in your hand. Bring it in your little hand. (laughs) Bring me that cake in your little hand. But you know, the word of the Lord defied logic. And miracles are against the ordinary course of nature. So the word of the Lord unto you before a miracle happens may defy all the logic you've ever had in your entire life. But what's about to happen also defies logic. What's about to happen also defies science. Also defies any other measure. You know, people are making a big deal right now. Oh, the science, the science, the science, the science. I have a science degree. You know what I learned the first day of getting my science degree is I learned this. Science is fallible. And what's proven today will be disproven tomorrow. Now Falsey and all his bunch are acting like uh, uh, science is science is science. Come on now. You know, you, it, science is going to change. You know, in the twinkling of an eye. <laughs> in the twinkling of an eye, when the dead in Christ rises first, it's going to be against science. When the dead in Christ rises up into glory and Jesus meets us in the air and then we which are alive and remain and our bodies are changed in the twinkling of an eye and we all are caught up together, it's going to defy science. And there may be some people on earth looking up at us, going up, saying science, science, science. And we're going to be looking down saying God, God, God. Hallelujah. John G. Lake in the middle of the Worst plague to ever hit the world. John G. Lake said, you know the throth that's on those dead people's mouth after they die from this. Put it on my hand. And then put my hand under a microscope. And they put his hand under a microscope in the froth. And they literally, scientists watched the microorganisms die on the hand of John G. Lake. He said, there's something in me that beats that death. There's something in me that beats that plague. I've been glorified on the inside. Well, Elijah, he said, hey, hey, I know what the science says. (laughs) Bring me a piece of bread. (laughs) And you know what? Jesus said in Luke 4 that there were many widows in Israel. But Elijah was sent to this lady. You know, don't you think God knew this lady's going to believe? This lady isn't going to go and and, uh, write a book on, on, uh, I was was poor and about to die. And the prophet said, give me all your money. I was about to die, and the TV evangelist said, if you don't give me your money, I'm going off the air. No, he he knew this widow was going to do it. Now, she made sure Elijah knew what was going on, but she still did it. She still stepped out in obedience, believing the word of the Lord. You know, I've known people that needed a financial miracle. And I'm not saying to do this unless God tells you to do it. But I've known people who needed a financial miracle that God told them, empty out your bank account. Give it. I've known people who've done that. He said, what was on the other side of that? A miracle. A financial miracle. I'm telling you. You you, you can go with logic. Or you can go with God. (laughs) And it defies logic. Because it defies your understanding, doesn't it? You can't just lean on everything you know. Now, you should have wisdom and use what you know. But there may come a day where what you know isn't doing it. You, you need God in the matter. I was a kid, end of a service. I used to stand by the door at their church. I used to stand by the door with my grandmother. And she would give everybody an evangel. Pentecost- A.G. used to put out something called the evangel. Pentecostal evangel. And she would stand by the door and greet people as they left and give everybody an evangel. 
And so I used to, at a certain age, I would stand by the door, and I would take the evangels and hand those out while Granny greeted everybody. And so I was standing by the door, and I saw this lady walk past us with no shoes. And this lady walked past us with no shoes, and, and I mean, she was dressed very nice. No shoes, but there were nylons there. Dressed nice. I'm not saying she was like uh, uh, um, a hippie, okay? <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with, with people who like to walk around barefoot. I'm not saying that. You know, it's, you know make sure your personal hygiene's good. It's all right. <laughs> now, you know, we have, a, we have a rule whenever I drive the youth van. We start out. Nobody's taking their shoes off. Because you're young and you haven't learned what clean socks are yet. Nobody, mm -mm, we're not doing that on the van, okay? Because <laughs> this window ain't, this window I can roll down isn't big enough, all right? <laughs> on the van, we got to keep the shoes on, glory to God. But she walked out, I mean, nicely dressed lady. And, and, and then she walked out the door into the parking lot. And, and I asked somebody that knew. I, I, I probably tried to ask Granny first and she didn't know. But I asked somebody, I knew, I said, that lady, I think I asked my mom. I said, that lady left with shoes. Sister so-and-so, she just walked right out of here. She didn't have any shoes on. And she said, the Lord laid it on her heart to give the shoes that she had on to somebody else she was sitting close to that morning. I said, glory to God. I didn't say that, but now I said, glory to God. At the time, I said, what? <laughs> It, that defies logic. Man, my, my feet are tender. If, if my soles just get a little worn down, I can feel every one of the rocks out here. There's been a couple of times that I needed something from the church, and I came up here in my house shoes. And in my house shoes, I was like, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> I can't even imagine stepping out here with no shoes. But hey, if, if Jesus had Peter walk on the water, we're going to be all right. But see, that, that, that defied logic. I don't know the end of that story, but wow. That defies logic, doesn't it? We serve a God of miracles. He, he still does financial miracles. Uh, he still does. He still does those. He still does it. God can do a miracle in your body. You know, you might need healing. You may need something healed, but you may need a miracle in your body. I know a man, he was a millionaire. Uh, um, I don't know where this is, uh, Luana, but... He lived close to wherever the Roy Rogers Museum is in California. And he used to fly uh, to Del Rio and other places. And he's a retired millionaire. And uh, he had just got accustomed to coming to our church. And one time he gave his testimony in our church. And his testimony was of complete heart failure. And his testimony was of how that the doctor said, you have to have a heart transplant. And he went on the list uh, to get a heart transplant. I don't know if they still do those today, but, but they definitely did then. And he said, your, your heart is so damaged. He had had so many heart attacks, vessels clogged. You know, I, I hadn't even heard back then of ballooning up arteries. I don't know if they were able to do that back then. But he said, you got to, he was on the list for a heart transplant. And he said, God, I need a miracle. God, I need a new heart. You know, he started feeling like he had more energy. And he went to the doctor. And the doctor started running tests. And then the doctor sent him to somewhere else and ran some more tests. And then the doctor brought him back in and set him down. And he said, look, I have all the tests that we did when I put you on the list to get a heart transplant. All I can, all I can say, and I don't even know if this is the right way to say it, but all I can say is you have a different heart now. There's absolutely no damage to the heart that you have. And the man looked at the doctor and he said, Doctor, God has given me a new heart. Well, couldn't the creator of the first organ go ahead and create another one? Oh, yeah, he could. Oh, yeah, he could. See, that's not a healing. That heart wasn't healed. There's a new heart in there. Hallelujah. I've heard of people having, they, they had their eardrum removed. And then the God of miracles worked on that ear. And they went back and they got tested and they got looked at. Oh, there's an eardrum there. Well, there wasn't before. Glory to God. 
And now there is because we serve a God of miracles. John chapter 9. John 9 verse 1 says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. If you're blind from birth, you probably need a miracle. That's probably not a healing. There's something missing. There's something that was, that was mutated. There's something that was never formed. You need a miracle. He saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see, sometimes religious people want to philosophize about the miracle you need. Man, if I need a miracle, I, I don't care to philosophize with you about what, why, or where. If I need a miracle, all I need to know is John 10.10. 10, the thief came to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus came that I might have life and have it more abundantly. That's all I need to know. I don't even need to know how it happened. I just need it to happen. Glory to God. Sometimes people worry so much about how that they talk themselves out of it happening. Sometimes people do so much research on the internet about what's afflicting them that they lose their faith in deliverance. You better do some research on God. You better do some research on the God of miracles. You better do at least as much research on the God of miracles as you're doing on sickness and disease. Because if you do all your research on sickness and disease, sickness and disease is going to win. Your faith's going to be in the sickness. Your faith's going to be in disease. Your faith's going to be in that satanic power that's come into your life to grip you and to stop you from doing God's work and what God has planned. But you better put your focus on thus saith the Lord. You better put your focus on there's a miracle God. I've got a miracle God. Jesus passed by. He saw this man. They had this foolish argument. Verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither this, this man nor his parents sin." but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me. While it is day, the night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spit on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. It was a miracle, a miracle. Some have said that maybe God has him, had him use clay since we were made of clay. I don't know. But I know this, that God did a miracle on this man's eyes. I know this, he once was blind, but now he could see. The disciples wanted to have a theological discussion about the reason that someone could be born blind, but the God of miracles wanted to perform a miracle. Some want to discuss the curse, but Jesus wants to reverse the curse. If you need a miracle in your body, the miracle worker is in the house today. God will provide a miracle for your protection. We see in Acts chapter 28, Paul had just been protected from a storm, a bad storm. The ship had been lost. Everybody on the ship was protected from that storm. And lives were not lost because of Paul's praying and interceding on their behalf. But just when you think he's free, just when you think he's done with danger, he's picking up sticks. Why? Because he's a servant. Now, some people, they, they can believe God to get out of the storm, but they can't believe God for servanthood. Come on now. If you, if you don't learn how to pick up some sticks, you might not see the miracles Paul saw. Come on now. Wasn't there anybody else that could pick up sticks? Plenty. Wasn't there anybody else that could build a fire? Plenty. But Paul's a servant. We've got to get a hold of servanthood in the body of Christ. Amen. So Paul's picking up sticks, and just when you think the danger's over, this poisonous snake grips his hand. And the poison starts oozing into his blood. Paul shakes that off in the fire and keeps going. Everyone knew about that snake. Everyone thought he's going to have a fever. They thought he's going to die. And they didn't. He didn't. Not because he was so great, but because we have a miracle working God. That was a miracle. That was a miracle. I remember Jennifer and Sarah were going to Broken Arrow for some meetings. And we had already, I think Charity and I came a different direction, but got there at some point. <clears throat> it was a big ice storm. And they came, and, and, and they lost control of their vehicle. And another vehicle was coming for them. And all they could say was Jesus. 
and they found themselves where they needed to be in the other vehicle where it needed to be. And they still don't quite, un, you know, they can't put their finger on it. Well, this happened, this happened, this happened, and this happened. And that's why I was over here and that car was now over here instead of that semi that was right in front of us and we were spinning into it. You can't put your, but it's a miracle. Doesn't matter how. Doesn't matter how God did it. God did it. He's a miracle working God. And he performs miracles of protection. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20. A great multitude of people in this chapter. A great multitude of people from three nations were coming up to defeat Israel. They were coming up to wipe them out. It was too many for the people of Israel in the natural. They were very outnumbered as they have been so many times. But God told them this through the prophet. I will fight for you. I will fight this battle. If you look in verse 22... Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. It says the Lord set ambushes against them. The Lord set ambushes against them. They came to a place where they could see the wilderness. Then God had caused these people to kill each other. They had been confused. They killed each other. And they can look down and they can see it. And the Bible says it took them three days to bring back the spoil of God's victory. You know what the spoil is? When you go and you have victory, the spoil is all their goods. The spoil is all the jewelry off them dead bodies. The spoil is off the coin purses from those people. They don't need them anymore, you know. That's a common thing when an army would go in and to totally annihilate another army and another people. After it was done, you collected spoil. This was God who did it. And it took them three days to collect the spoil. It was a miracle of provision. Our God's a miracle worker. There's nothing too hard for Him. Whatever miracle you will ever need, just believe all things are possible to those who believe. The impossible becomes possible when God's involved. Waters part when God's involved. Walls come down when God's involved. Prison doors are open when God is involved. Prisoners are set free when God is involved. Dead men get up when God's involved. Ears come forth when God's involved. Legs spread Spring out when God's involved. Arms come out when God's involved. Broken bones go back together when God's involved. Muscle reconnects when God's involved. Spines line up when God is involved. Disease of the mind leaves the mind when God is involved. This is the God that raises the dead. This is the God that made time stand still. This is the God that shuts the mouths of lions. This is the God that transported people through time and space. This is the God that opens prison doors. The God that kicked the devil out of heaven. The God of glory. The all-consuming fire. The almighty. The everlasting. The one who was and is and is to come. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. There's nothing you could ever face that's any match to the miracle that God can do. If your God be for you, then who could be against you? Stand with me this morning. He is a God of miracles. There is nothing you could need. There is nothing that you could face. That He hasn't already been there. That He hasn't already made up a plan. That He hasn't already seen to your hope, to your future. This God, this powerful, miracle, working God, wants to dote on you. You have favor with Him. He, he sent Jesus to break covenant with you. He loves you. He doesn't want you to go through hardship. He wants you to get on the other side of hardship. He doesn't want you to go through pain. It doesn't matter if you're five years old or you're 95. His plan for you is not pain. His plan for your body is not to break down. His plan for your body is not to be missing anything. 
It said of Moses that even his eyes weren't dim. Even his eyes weren't dim. If God would do it for Moses, God would do it for me because he's no respecter of persons. God's will for you is not to be weak. That's why, that's why he said, let the weak say I'm strong. Let the weak say I'm strong. That's why he said, they that wait upon me, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up. You know what it means to mount up? When you mount up, you're ready. And I don't know if you ever mounted up before, but mounting up in somebody who's weakly. Mounting up in for somebody that can barely move. Mounting up for somebody that's strong. Somebody that can put their foot in the stirrup and kick the other foot around, stand up straight in the saddle, and be ready for battle. You weren't called to be weak. You weren't called for disease. Jesus said, that's the thief. That's satanic. If there's something killing from you, that's not God. If there's something trying to destroy you, that's not God. So, well, I thought when I became a certain age, I just, I had to have fibromyalgia. No. I thought when I became a certain age, I had to have, uh, what's that in the joints? Arthritis. Uh-uh. No. No, there's no heavenly arthritis. Well, I, I was around 10 people that are sneezing and snotting all over me. I guess I have to have COVID. Why? Who said? Well, I got COVID. I guess I got to die. Who said? Who said? We got to examine some things, right? Well, you know, my dad had this and my mom. And, you know, my whole family, they got the sugar diabetes, type 2. And, you know, I'm a little overweight, so I got to have sugar diabetes. What? Who said? Why can't you be the first that don't? Huh? Why, why can't you be the first that comes out of that curse? Who said you got to have sugar diabetes? Well, uh, the doctor, no, hey, thank God for doctors. I like to see them on occasion, even if I have to wait four hours. I usually go in and say, thank you, Your Highness, for giving me an audience. I'm so honored to be in your little room today with you because I know that must be how they feel since I just had to wait four hours to get in there. I'm joking. We sort of. Now who said we got to put up with this nonsense? Do we serve a God of miracles? Say, well, you know, my job, my education. Who said that that qualifies or disqualifies you for a good job. You know, some of the richest people in the world hardly have an education and failed multiple times before they became the richest people in the world. There's nothing wrong with an education. You know, you can be educated in several different things. You know what I mean? You know, uh, you need, you need uh, welders to be educated in how to weld without that steel breaking. Don't you, Ruth? Because an uneducated welder, someone who's not educated in welding, it, it's going to be sloppy, isn't it? You're going to have some really weak joints there. Hey, that's, that's not, ASU don't have welding. But how many of you know we need people that can weld? You can have education in several different things, but even then, it doesn't define you. You know what I'm saying here? Absolutely. We get a little silly about stuff. Amen. What am I saying? I'm saying your financial miracle is depending on the miracle worker. Now, if he directs you, hey, go get a degree or enhance your degree or do this, you do it because he's a miracle worker. Elijah didn't have to go to that widow, but he did because the miracle worker said go to that widow. The widow didn't have to bring him cake, but she did because the miracle worker said, bring me some cake. So you find out what the miracle worker needs you to do. Because if you look through the Bible at all the miracles, 
God would oftentimes have somebody do something. They'd go dip in the Jordan seven times. Well, that's stupid. Have you ever seen the Jordan? I don't know how nasty the Jordan was back then, but the Jordan is short and nasty. To, isn't it, Prezi? I see her shaking her head. It's got to be, uh, it, it's probably worse than Nazareth. I mean, we, there, was some, there was some people in my group, they're like, we want to get baptized in the Jordan just like Jesus. I saw the Jordan, I said, bless Jesus' heart. My baptism was just as good. Hallelujah. <laughs> he went to extra mile on getting baptized in that mud. <laughs> no, but that don't make sense. But you know what? When he come up the seventh time and he didn't have leprosy, well, that made sense, didn't it? When Jesus went to spitting in some guy's eyeballs, that guy may have been like, I'm blind, but I have feeling. Is that spit? Did you just spit on me? And that feels a lot like dirt. Is that mud? And Jesus said, go wash off. And I'm sure he thought in his mind, bless the Lord, the very thing I wanted to do. But he's real specific. Go wash off in the pool of Siloam. I didn't say go to your grandma's house and have her pump up the well. Go wash off in the pool of Siloam. And he did, and there's a miracle. You serve a miracle working God. Amen. He, fix, he fixes blood pressure, don't he, Rhonda? He fixes it because he's a miracle working God. Hallelujah. Just, just for a few minutes, just, just praise the miracle working God. Father, we just praise you. You're the miracle worker. You're the miracle worker. We don't have to understand exactly how you do it. We just know you do it. You do it. You do it. You do it. You make hearts new. You make lungs new. You give people new kidneys. You give people new livers. You're the miracle worker. You do miracles in people, God. You give people sight. You give people hearing. You heal minds. You heal bodies. And you do miracles so great. Thank you, Father, for the miracles. Hallelujah. Bless your name. How many of you this morning, either financial, in body, or there's some things that you really need protection from right now? But you need the miracle worker. Especially right now, you need the miracle worker. Raise your hand. Raise your hands. I need the miracle worker. See these hands? Hands going up everywhere. I need the miracle worker. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Right now, we're going to go to the miracle worker. Right now, let's go to the one who does miracles. Do you have that song? You do miracles so great. Let's go to him right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, there's miracles needed all across this room. Whatever the miracle is, right now, you say what the miracle is. Financial, body, protection, you say right now, I need a miracle right here. I need a miracle right here. I, need, I don't know how it's going to be done. I don't know how you could do it, but I believe you, and I know you could do it. I need a miracle right now in my mortal body. I need a miracle right now in my checkbook. I need a miracle right now of protection. You may be having to go to some places. You may be involved in some things that, that you feel uh, fearful. That there's some in the natural, some reasons to be afraid for, what, for what's around you right now. He, perform, he performs miracles of protection. Tell him about it right now. Tell him about it right now. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We believe in the laying on of hands, but it doesn't seem like what we're supposed to do right now. You're going to the miracle worker. You're going to the miracle worker. I can't do anything anyways. It'd only be if he, if he moves through me. But he's moving on you directly right now. Miracle worker. Miracles right now. Miracles right now. Miracles in marriage right now. Miracles in marriage right now. Miracles in families right now. Miracles in the name of Jesus. Miracles in the name of Jesus. It's a miracle. Most of us are in this room right now. He still does miracles. Miracles in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Can you sing it? Glory to God. You deserve it.
honor of yours. Changes right now. It changes. We give God the glory. He loves you. He loves you. 
He loves you that much. Do you feel His love this morning? Hallelujah. I'm so thankful for His anointing. I'm so thankful for His presence. You know He's real. You know He's real. He's not far away. He's real. He's absolutely real. Absolutely real. presence is tangible. It's tangible. More than anybody's presence you'll ever feel, His presence is tangible. Knowing Him is the greatest honor of your entire life. There is nothing, there is nothing that will ever compare to your introduction with Him. Nothing greatest honor you were ever given is that someone said, I want to introduce you to God. This is the greatest honor of your life. It is the greatest honor of my life. We can never forget that. We can never forget that. Let's give Him glory. so good. There's nothing that's more important than worshiping you. There's nowhere I have to be right now. There's nowhere I have to be. I have to be with you. I have to be with you. I have to tell you that I love you. I have to honor you. I have to thank you. I have to thank you. Thank you, God. No one will take your place. No one will take your place. No one compares to you. Nothing compares to you. I honor you. In Jesus' name. I honor you, God. I honor you. this morning, if you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life, keep playing that. If you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life, raise your hand. If you're not saved, if you're not born again, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Is anybody here this morning and you've been saved but you went away from God, you walked away. You left fellowship with Him, you walked away coming back today. You want to come back today? You walked away. That's all the way I'm going to put it. You walked away. But you want to come back. If that's you, raise your hand. If you're watching on the YouTube channel and Facebook Live, if you're not saved, you need to be saved. If you've walked away, it's time to come back into fellowship. He's real. He's real. And he's missed you. He's missed those times you used to have. When you would feel his presence. Somebody in this room. When you would feel his presence so strong in your bedroom and it was just you and him. And you would start to cry. Because you just felt his presence. You just knew you just knew God was there with you. He misses those times. is ready when you're ready if you're not saved but you believe right now you believe in your heart God sent his only begotten son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins Jesus rose from the grave you believe that you confess it with your mouth you confess Jesus he's my Lord I'll serve him 
Jesus, He is my Savior. He saved me. You believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth, and you're saved. But what if you've done that and you walked away? He said this, if you'll come to Him, admit it, repent for it, ask for forgiveness, He'll cleanse you. He'll forgive you. He'll change you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In Acts chapter 2, and all through the book of Acts, all through the New Testament church, there's a subsequent event, the people who were getting saved. And it was so powerful that all these people were getting saved because of Philip the evangelist in Samaria. But they had this one concern in the heads of the church. They said, are they getting baptized in the Holy Spirit? Are they getting baptized in the Holy Spirit? So they sent Peter and John as a delegation to the people in Samaria. And they said, have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit? Hallelujah. Glory to God. The power, the power, the power, the power, the power. Jesus said you'll be witness when the power comes upon you. Qualifications are to be saved. But if you're here this morning, you say, you know, I want that Pentecostal experience. I, I, I want that that comes after you're saved. I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. I want that. So do I have to have that to get to heaven? No, you don't. You're full of the Spirit on the inside. But I tell you, if you want the power in your life, and you want the Spirit upon you, not just in you, hallelujah, then that's what we're talking about, being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to dismiss everybody today. I planned on being at the door to be able to shake everybody's hand, to hug everybody I could. But I want you to know, especially if I haven't seen you in a long time, I've missed you. There's a few of you I haven't seen in quite a while. I've really missed you. And if you want to call this week, or, or maybe we can have a coffee or, or have some lunch or something, I'm available, okay? And we can have some fellowship. But I, I, I sense that maybe there's somebody that wants to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so we want to make way for that. We want to make room for that. Glory to God. Hallelujah. How could we deny someone that power that Jesus made available? Glory to God. And so you might also be here and you say, you know, I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, the evidence of speaking in other tongues, but I haven't done that in forever. It's almost like it didn't happen, and the enemy's trying to tell me it didn't happen, although I know it happened. But I just need to be renewed in that. I, I want to be rebaptized. I just want the glory on me again. And so if that's you, you come up here too. Everybody else, we love you. God bless you. Please come back Wednesday if you can. But if you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, come up front right now. Hallelujah.